Hello to all readers, authors, Writers Week fans and regular attendees. I'm Jo Dyer and I'm the Director of Writers Week and delighted to present some of the highlights of the program we have put together under sometimes challenging circumstances for our return to the Pioneer Women's Memorial Gardens on February 27. A return that is so highly anticipated by so many in our communities of writers, publishers and readers. We're recording this from the Circulating Library of the State Library of South Australia, Ghana Country. This time last year, we were affectionately rolling our eyes at those authors that withdrew from the festival because of COVID-related fears of travel. As the 2020 Writers' Week progressed, we reluctantly graduated from warm hugs of greetings for incoming participants to trying out awkward substitutes. The Elpo bump hadn't quite caught on by then and still has something of an eager politician vibe for my liking. Robin Archer tried to get an ankle rub to catch on. Ben Law experimented with a brief bow. But as we settled on a sheepish wave, we never imagined that ours would be the last major literary festival to squeak in before sweeping bans on mass gatherings were announced. Before event after event was cancelled, lockdowns were announced and 2020 began its great strange pivot online. And now we're back. And we're ready to ask the questions the last odd year has provoked. What just happened? What happens next? What does it all mean? And what should we read to forget about the unstable ground on which we've tried to get used to, but are now heartily sick of standing? We'll be looking at these issues literally, diving into the issues the pandemic and the other big movements of 2020 have raised for our leaders and our communities, and laterally, looking at pandemics in fiction, our vulnerabilities and fragilities. We'll be looking at the impact of the pandemic on the world and Australia's place within it, and how it has changed our relationship with the region and the future. And we'll be looking at what we can do to affect change in our society and in our lives, and where we can find solace from it all. So, where do we find ourselves now? Some of our international authors are supremely well positioned to ponder that question. One of the victims of COVID is our capacity to host international authors in person, however. Ongoing travel restrictions and quarantine requirements ruled that out around the middle of last year. But we decided the times and the global nature of so many of our current challenges warranted the inclusion of international perspectives anyway. So some of the world's great minds will live stream into the gardens, including the historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author of Twilight of Democracy, Anne Applebaum. Based on wide expertise and deep personal experience, Twilight of Democracy brilliantly illuminates the seduction of totalitarian thinking and one party rule and the threat it poses to what have been revealed to be quite fragile democracies. Documenting the experience she lived through in Poland, where Anne's husband, Radek Sikorski, served as finance minister in the centre-right government of Donald Tusk, Twilight of Democracy is an astute and rigorous account of how those who loudly proclaimed their commitment to democracy, and in some European cases, fought and shed blood for it, ultimately succumbed to liars, thugs and crooks. There is a fascinating account of how swathes of Poland were persuaded to believe the lie of the Smolensk conspiracy, that a plane crash that killed Poland's president and half of the then cabinet in 2010 was not caused by poor visibility and pile an error in thick fog, as the official investigation found, but was brought down by nefarious actors, variously named as Russia, domestic enemies or Western foes. Anne draws parallels with the promotion of the Smolensk, Smolensk conspiracy and Trump's early advocacy of birtherism, the lie that Obama was born outside of America and so was not eligible to be president of the United States. Like the Smolensk conspiracy, in order for this to be true, vast numbers of people in the American health system, the broader bureaucracy and government would have to have been in on the lie, a fact with which the lies proponents don't, won't and can't engage. This type of wild spinning was exemplified and amplified further in the deliberately dishonest propagation of the illegitimacy, the steal of the recent US election. Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India is part of the collection of new global strongmen that Anne Applebaum analyzes. And in Arundhati Roy's collection of essays, Azadi, Freedom in Urdu, 
Arundhati takes us through history in real time as she excoriates India's slide into authoritarianism, dissecting Modi's legislation to deprive Muslims of citizenship and to purge universities of textbooks that contain thoughts and ideas, including historical events, that contradict his BJP government's view of the world. Arundhati's fierce forensic writings provide chilling insight into India's current politics and demonstrate again the intellectual and moral power of the Booker Prize winning author and her courageous and uncompromising advocacy for India's underprivileged. Global economist and best-selling author Narina Hertz has been described by The Observer as one of the world's leading thinkers. Her new book, The Lonely Century, dissects the contemporary epidemic of loneliness and documents the fragmentation of community, mounting a compelling case that humans are not built for the atomized existences so many of us are now living, and that the ensuing loneliness is astonishingly bad for our physical and mental health. She calls for a more compassionate capitalism. If you can't get to the garden, all three of these sessions can also be accessed as part of a new initiative in 2021 Writers Week's Curated Dozen, streamed live from our place to yours. We've selected 12 events across the week featuring both international and local authors that can be accessed online from the comfort of your home, with tickets purchased via our website on a pay-what-you-can basis. Look out for the Curated Dozen logo by the irrelevant event in our brochure, or check out our website to see the details of all streamed events and how to buy your tickets. If that's the state of the world, where is Australia right now? Despite the frustrations of 2020, particularly for our Victorian friends, we have indisputably emerged from the COVID crisis better than most. Whether because we're a remote island or because of our swift, firm lockdowns, or even our state's propensity to slam borders shut at the slightest scare, Australia has kept infection rates relatively low. But there were other ramifications for us. Our increasingly strained relationship with China took a further hit when we unilaterally called for an investigation into the virus's origins. And we now hear of lobsters mouldering on tarmacs in Shanghai and wine and beef exports stuck at Chinese ports. Former Australian ambassador to China, Jeff Rabi, and associate professor of China studies at the University of Technology, Sydney, Chong Yi Fen, discussed the state of our relationship with China in There Goes the Neighbourhood. We look at the state of Australian leadership in a session with two of our most incisive political thinkers, Laura Tingle and Catherine Murphy. How long will the halo of COVID competence keep Scotty from marketing ahead in the polls? Can Albo become relevant? What does a Biden presidency mean for Morrison and Australia's increasingly isolated position on climate change? We ask if we can follow the science so well on COVID, why can't we do so for climate change? Marion Wilkinson gives us a disturbing answer in her book, The Climate Club, revealing the network of powerful climate change skeptics, politicians and business leaders who have sought to control Australia's climate policy for shamefully self-interested reasons. And where's the science in our handling of one of our most precious resources of all, water? The River Runs Dry, our event on the Murray-Darling Basin, examines this question featuring Council Assisting South Australia's recent Royal Commission on the Basin, Richard Beasley, author of the quarterly essay, Crimea River, Margaret Simons, and Deputy Chair of the Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations, Grant Rigney. We'll consider how we got to where we are now, hearing reflections from not one, but two former Prime Ministers, Malcolm Turnbull and Julia Gillard. Malcolm looking back on his time in and departure from office in the bigger picture, Julia looking forward in her new book, Women and Leadership, co-written with former Nigerian Finance Minister Ngozi Okonjo Iweala about the best way to encourage more women into positions of political leadership. We'll also look further into the past with Kate Grenville's new novel, A Room Full of Leaves, inspired by the letters of Elizabeth MacArthur, wife of the corrupt early Australian settler John MacArthur, and with Julie Jansen's Benevolence, conceived as a direct response to Grenville's The Secret River. It tells of the early days of our colonial settlement history from the perspective of Aboriginal woman Murugging and her experience in the Native Institute, a school for Aboriginal children set up in Parramatta for ostensibly benevolent reasons by Governor Macquarie and his wife Elizabeth. 
This reinterpretation of history, seeing history from the perspective of the other, is also encompassed in Chinese-American author Pam Zhang's novel, How Much of These Hills is Gold? A masterful retelling of both the American West and the classic American Western that tells of Chinese-American orphans Lucy and Sam's quest through the Californian hills during the gold rush as they seek to bury the body of their father in a homeland that constantly tells them, this land is not your land. We read a different history too in Mirandi Rowie's Stone Sky Cold Mountain, which details Australia's own gold rush from the perspective of Chinese siblings Ying and Lai Yu. And we read it in Nguyen Phan K. Mai's The Mountains Sing, an immersive epic novel that, through the story of one family, recounts Vietnam's dark history of colonialism and war from the perspective of its people rather than its invaders. Other Writers' Week authors are seeking to interpret our confounding present. Laura Jean Mackay couldn't have been more prescient with the March 2020 release of The Animals in That Country, her mind-bending novel about a virus vampaging through Australia with its key symptom in humans, the ability to communicate with other species. It became one of the first must-read novels of lockdown. Laura is joined by a live stream for a session on pandemics in fiction by Canadian-American author Emily St. John Mandel, whose breakout 2014 novel, Station Eleven, about a more virulent illness that killed off 90% of the Earth's population in a matter of weeks, was an international sensation when released and set the standard for literary virus disasters. Some of the characters from Station Eleven also feature in Emily's latest book, The Stunning The Glass Hotel, a novel about the porous boundaries between past and present, rich and poor, living and dead, in which a guest of the titular hotel, Jonathan, whisks its beautiful barwoman, Vincent, off to his kingdom of money, only for it to turn out to be a golden mirage. Kerouin Dovey's latest novel is utterly contemporary, drawing on her own experience at Harvard, where she was a classmate of both Natalie Portman and Jared Kushner, to tell a tale of five old friends on the cusp of middle age, meeting at their 15-year Harvard reunion and wondering if they're wasting, their, or if they're wasting or realising their potential. And then the president's son turns up dead. Colin McCann's masterful novel, A Pyrrhagan, is a story of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the most personal of stories of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of two fathers, one Israeli, one Palestinian, who have both lost daughters to the conflict and through their shared loss and quest for peace, become firm friends. Described by the New York Times as an empathy engine that far more than making an argument for peace is itself an engine of change, a Pyrrhagan is heartbreaking and a stunningly lyrical celebration of friendship and love, courage and truth. Fernanda Melkor's Hurricane Season, shortlisted for the International Booker, also tells powerful truths. An extraordinary howl of a novel about patri patriarchal violence and femicide in Mexico today. It is a breathtaking book. A journalist by trade, Fernanda has said she wrote the novel after reading a story in the newspaper. I was surprised, she said, because the journalist told the story in a way that made, made it sound normal to think that a crime could be motivated by witchcraft. The murderer had killed the witch because she was doing witchcraft to make him fall back in love with her. I was stunned by this and just wanted to write the story behind the crime. In doing so, she has written a dark novel of prose, of beauty, poetry and brutality that explores Mexico's embrace of the supernatural while seeking to hold the violent to account. Christina Lamb also seeks to hold the violent to account for the pandemic of violence against women in war in her towering book, our bodies, their battlefields, what war does to women. Rape, she writes, is the cheapest weapon known to man. One of the world's foremost war correspondents, a 30-year veteran of war and combat zones, Christina has written a book that is both horrific and profoundly moving, giving voice to the silent sufferers of war, including Manira, a Rohingya raped by Burmese soldiers, Esther Akubu, whose daughter Dorcas was one of the schoolgirls taken by Boko Haram in Nigeria in 2014, and Victoire and Serafina, two Tutsi sisters who survived the Rwandan genocide of 1994. 
This important book is a powerful corrective to the silence around the use of rape as a weapon of war and how the victims of rape have their suffering enabled, perpetuated and ignored. Described as the Simone de Beauvoir of the 21st century, Australia's own Kate Mann, now an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cornell, is credited with reframing misogyny and male entitlement in her celebrated companion writings, Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny, and Entitled, How Male Privilege Hurts Women. Revelatory in their insight and lucidity, Kate describes misogyny as operating as the law enforcement arm of patriarchy that polices and punishes bad women who threaten male dominance, and entitlement as something that enables men to illegitimately grasp power and authority for themselves and demand emotional and physical care from women. Both these books, I believe, are destined to become classic feminist texts. Back here in Australia, we'll look at our cities and suburbs and our dynamic population. Legendary South Australian poet Jeff Goodfellow grew up in the inner northern suburbs in working class Adelaide. In his first foray into prose, his memoir Out of Copley Street, A Working Class Boyhood, Jeff writes of his experiences in a series of finely drawn vignettes, vivid glimpses into a childhood blighted with a shadow of his father's alcoholism, full of the language and wry humour of a bygone suburban Australia. The suburbs look quite different as the years go by and to those who enter them from elsewhere and see them through the eyes of a curious newcomer. Christopher Raja was 11 when his family migrated to the Melbourne suburbs after an early childhood spent in Kolkata, India. The clean and quiet streets of outer Melbourne took a bit of getting used to. As his parents' optimism starts to waver, Christopher embraces his new life until the atomising, exhausting effect of being treated as outsiders takes its toll on his family. Outsiders in Australia are nothing new, and two impressive debut novels tell the stories of migrants forging paths in Australia. Vivian Pham was only 17 when she finished The Coconut Children, her story of second generation Vietnamese Australians and their lives in Cabramatta. It is a love story, a coming of age story, and the story of a community. Andrew Pippos' debut novel, Luckies, is a multi-generational, sprawling tale inspired by Andrew's own life growing up in the Greek-Australian cafe scene. This tightly woven story centres on a Greek-American airman known as Lucky, who stays in Australia after World War II to build a life and a business, a string of cafes initially wildly successful that he franchises to friends and mostly fellow Greeks. Both books remind us how Australia is shaped and lifted by the waves of immigration that reach our shores. With the vexed debate about Australia's National Day pre predictably raging for another year, does Australia think, currently think of itself as one nation or a collection of former colonies? As state borders kept slamming shut over the last 12 months, you could be forgiven for thinking the latter. Certainly, significant regional differences exist between our cities and states. In 2010, New South Publishing commissioned a series of elegant small books, essays, to explore and celebrate Australia's major cities. Each book written by a local with a deep love and understanding of and connection to the city about which they wrote, offering poetic, imaginative insight into the personality of their city and its peoples. Ten years on, New South has published updated editions of each of the books, with new words from the original author. Before COVID, the idea that borders between Australian states would be closed, that we'd have so-called hard borders, would have been ludicrous. So after a year when our separateness and state-based identities have been relentlessly emphasised, we present a special double session featuring all eight authors of the updated city series chaired by George Megalogenis. What makes each Australian city so unique, different from the others, and what traits do they share? What and where are the key rivalries, similarities, fault lines? Don't miss this literary and cultural audit of the state of our cities and their relationship to each other and the country, with Adelaide represented by a longtime friend of Writers' Week, Karen Goldsworthy. One of the many reasons we're all so excited about Writers' Week is that for such a long time our social lives became two-dimensional, reduced to a screen. For the first couple of weeks of lockdown, it was all great fun. Quarantinis and covid 19 abounded as cocktail hour drew in old mates from time zones all over the world. But as the week stretched on, the novelty wore off and Zoom-based socialising and events lost some of their appeal. 
So spare a thought for all the authors who launched their books in 2020. Yes, an online launch was better than nothing, but it's not quite the same as standing in a room with people who love you and hopefully your book, celebrating the start of its journey into the world together. So, at the brilliant suggestion of author of Where the Fruit Falls, Karen Wilde, on Saturday, February 27th at 6.15, we are relaunching eight South Australian books featured in the program that missed out on an in-person launch in 2020. Join us to celebrate Danielle Claude and In Search of the Woman Who Sailed the Earth, an ingenious telling of Jean Barrett's great and unlikely adventure of the 1770s, a French peasant who became the first woman to circumnavigate the globe. Durkhan Ayubi's Pawana, Recipes and Stories from an Afghan Kitchen, is a celebration of a family, a food, a country, a culture and an Adelaide icon. Just Money is Royce Kermilov's telling, telling exploration of Australia's love affair with debt and the predatory industry that has grown around it. Another one of the must-read books of early lockdown, Pitt Williams' The Dictionary of Lost Words, is the story of the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary told through the eyes of a rare female lexicographer, Esme, as she learns to value the words and ways of her sex and fight for its rights. Karen Wilde's Where the Fruit Falls combines magic realism, poetic po prose and an epic family saga in a richly detailed, powerful story of trauma, family and country. Patrick Allington's acid-sharp satire, Rise and Shine, imagines a future in which we're literally nourished by violence. Catherine Tomiko Argyle's beautiful evocation of the damage we bring to the relationships that mean the most to us, the things she owned, illuminates the relationship between Erica and her complicated mother, Michiko, and how Erica got to know Michiko only after her death, one object at a time. Rachel Mead whisks us around the streets of Adelaide in an ambulance with Tash and Joel as they provide assistance to the injured and the restless and each other in the deeply human and always engaging the application of pressure. They're eight very different books that all deserve their moment, albeit belated, in the spotlight, in person. There's a lot more on offer at Writers' Week. For the first time, we're activating the Plain Tree stage every day, with the Writing for Performance Showcase on Sunday growing again to now encompass spoken word and slam poetry with Hear Me Roar, deaf storytelling with See Me Through My Hands, and a platform for First Nations writers First Words, the last two sessions presented in partnership with Writers SA. On Monday, you can learn the business of being a writer. If you dream of being a published writer, this series is for you. As publishers, booksellers, agents and authors explain the business of writing in a series of events presented in partnership with Fremantle Press, specifically curated for aspiring authors. Tuesday is all about activism and advocacy, when audiences are invited to be the change they wish to see in the world. Featuring some of our best known and most effective activists, including Jess Scully, Briggs, Rebecca Huntley, Sally Rugg, and Young School Strikes for Climate organiser Jean Hinchliffe, new series Be The Change seeks to combat the feelings of helplessness and impotence that can overwhelm us when confronted with issues on an institutional, societal or global scale, and give us practical and inspiring advice for how you can turn your frustration into action and become part of the solution to our world's myriad urgent problems. And Writers Week always enjoys bringing out the big guns. Shortlisted for this year's Booker, Marza Mengista and The Shadow King, Winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction, The Stunning Hamnet from Maggie O'Farrell. The inventor of cyberspace, William Gibson, predicts the present in his latest novel, Agency. Australia's own Booker Prize winner, Richard Flanagan, joins us with his harrowing ode to love, loss and disappearance, living sea of waking dreams, as well as eight other Australian authors who have won or been shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award, including two-time winner Alex Miller, the aforementioned Kate Grenville, Sophie Laguna, Craig Sylvie, James Bradley, Gail Jones, Robert Desai, and crowd favourite, the dashing Trent Dalton. And after a year of tumult and stress, we'll examine ways to find peace and peace of mind with Christine Jackman, who decided to turn down the noise and embrace the quiet power of silence. Rick Morton, who spent a year consciously living vulnerably after a diagnosis of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Hugh Mackay, who turned his gaze inward in the inner self, the joy of discovering who we really are. Julia Baird, whose best-selling phosphorescence helps us find the light within to sustain us through dark times. And Tegan Bennett Daylight and Deborah Adelaide, who remind us of the simple joys of reading, which is what, in the end, draws us all together each March in the Pioneer Women's Memorial Gardens. Get there early this year as you have to scan in on entry with one of the ubiquitous QR codes. And there will be a few other COVID safe protocols to observe around the gardens, particularly in relation to access to the book tent and the catering tent. But apart from that, we hope the 2021 Writers Week experience will be as stimulating, surprising and inspiring as ever. Do look out for our full program at good bookstores near you and we look forward to seeing you in the gardens on February 27.